Okay, this is Q and A. Yeah. So how would the rab define philosophy? Well, um, a definition of philosophy is going to be personal. Probably the best thing to do is to read an introduction of philosophy, let's say 50 or 100 pages, and then you have some idea what philosophy is about. Um, but I, I associate philosophy with uh, a process of thinking where everything can be investigated. Nothing's taken for granted. I think it's fair that, to say that in every other discipline, there are certain rules by which the discipline is defined. That's how it's done. And that when you are dealing with the discipline, you don't go behind those rules. Mathematics depends upon axioms. Um, empirical science follows something called the scientific method, and although that's very hotly debated, um, with, when you're doing science, you don't go behind the method. Um, so uh, philosophy is the project of having no holds barred. Nothing's off limits for consideration. Um, in practice, philosophy divides into two uh, main categories. There's what could be called pure philosophy on the one hand and philosophy of on the other hand. Pure philosophy consists traditionally of epistemology, which is the study of knowledge, metaphysics, which is the study of what is, natures of existence and categories of existence, and then something called value theory, which is like ethics and aesthetics. Then there's philosophy of science, philosophy of language, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of law. That's where you take philosophical techniques of thinking and apply them to ongoing practices, practices that are already entrenched and are, are, are part of our culture. And you use philosophical techniques of thinking in order to clarify those ongoing projects. Uh, in Jewish uh, thought, there's a great deal of philosophy of. There's some pure philosophy, especially ethics, um, but not a lot. Uh, almost all the philosophical thinking is philosophy of philosophy of God, which is something that's called theology, and philosophy of law, which is a gigantic amount because of our legal texts, philosophy of language to a certain extent, political philosophy. Um, that's roughly what I would say about, about philosophy. Yeah? Um, how convincing do you find the uh, modal ontological argument, which, in my understanding, would be a guy who's necessarily impossible, who's necessarily possible in the Mediterranean world? Okay, a lot of people who worked on this, uh, Alvin Plantinga did a job on it, and, and Kurt Gödel did a job on it, and, and they got into all sorts of subtleties of the semantics of modal logic and, and all the rest. Um, my problem with those arguments is, suppose they're right, what does it get you? There must be a necessary being, okay, uh-huh. What about having pork chops for lunch? You know, what about the exodus? What about, what about keeping Shabbos? And none of that is touched has nothing to do with morality, it's just, so it's, you know, one, one uh, brick in, in, a, in a structure, and it helps support the structure, but by itself it doesn't get you much. Uh, it could reduce the, the burden of, of argument by saying this piece can be supported in the following logical way, but it can't get you, that's why in my book I ignored that. Um, and it's immen immensely controversial. So whatever you're going to say, there'll be a lot of people who are going to disagree with you. Um, my attitude towards using philosophy is, if someone complains that the position I'm taking is outmoded, it's been discovered to be false, uh, modern thought has revealed that it's not correct, then if I find a respectable strand in the philosophical community that believes it, those claims are, for, are wrong. I don't use philosophy to establish something's true, but I use philosophy to establish that it has not been ruled out. Uh, and I think that, that's where it's, it's useful. Uh, but I do use philosophical thinking. I do that all the time. So. Do you like theological arguments for God, whether like fine-tuning, teleological, contingency, things like that? So they're all very different. They're, and they have different bases. Some are empirically based. Some are, some are pure logic. Uh, I, because I'm 
interest in philosophy of science, I think the, um, the argument for design and the, and the fine-tuning arguments are, are interesting because I, I'm interested in the logic. I'll just make one more remark and we'll go on to another question. It, it's fascinating to me that Maimonides has in the guide an argument for the existence of God based on disorder. Because the heavens are disordered, therefore they have to be created. It's the exact opposite of the kind of argument that people have made today from the, on the basis of order. But if we understand that, you have to understand their own, where he's coming from, what his background and assumptions are. You have a question? Oh, yeah. what's your opinion on Spinoza's geometric proof of God? Here he kind of like imitated Hobbes in a way of like using ge geometry and axioms to prove God. But rather than Hobbes used geometry for political science, whereas Spinoza used it for more of a... Okay, theory. Hobbes and Spinoza using geometry to prove God, it, it's, a, it's really a not, not a correct description. They, he didn't start with circles and triangles and, and hexagons being the regular figure that can equally tile without any missing space, a surface with, with a right. minimum uh, boundary well, for, for like the, to enclose the volume, enclose the, the area that's not, that's geometry. He didn't use any of that. What he used was a kind of axiomatic method, which originated with Euclid and was brought into the, but axiomatization on the one hand and geometry on the other are two different ideas. One has nothing, has very little to do with the other. All of, it, all of mathematics has been axiomatized and it's not all geometry. Right. Geometry is just one little tiny pocket of mathematics. So to call it geometry, he's not using geometry. He's using a kind of axiomatic method. Well, axioms are useful to making clear the kinds of proofs that you are, are delivering. You state explicitly what your assumptions are. You're supposed to be using logic that's transparent and obvious. Intuitively, even Aristotle had this. You had something that we could be called formal logic. If you do that, your logic is, is very trivial and very open, very explicit, very obvious. And that gives at least the form of your argument a very clear structure. Here are the substantive assumptions that I'm making. We can discuss and debate them, why we should accept them or not. And then I'm going to use very open, transparent, and trivial logic to get from my assumptions to my conclusion. I applaud that because it's, it's, it's organized, and, it, and hopefully you have all of the things that you're using on the table. You're not uh, making assumptions, even unconsciously. I'm not talking about viciously. You're not using unconscious assumptions to drive your argument, which is very hard to guard against. But it has no claim whatsoever to getting you true conclusions. Right. So I, I, I think it's a matter of Historical interest only. I don't think it has anything to do with trusting the conclusions. All the argument will be based in, on whether you accept the premises or not. And in the case of Spinoza, I mean, I'm not a Spinoza a specialist, and I didn't specialize in history philosophy, but the, the, what I glanced at was not convincing at all. And I don't, think, I don't think other people are convinced either. Yeah. I mean, the Lord mentioned yesterday that you can't love something that you don't know. So I just wondering, in that case, how is one supposed to love God? I'm sorry, say, I can't, in that case, what? How is one supposed to love God? You love what about him you know. That's why he has revealed himself to us in the, to the extent that we can understand. If he had not revealed himself to us, uh, to us then uh, we wouldn't be able to love him. Exactly that. Exactly that. But what we love about him is what he's revealed to us. Not more. Yeah? How does someone's name define a person? Say that again? How what? How does like, someone's name define a person? Oh, I don't think a name defines a person. At most, a name could uh, refer to a quality which is important in that person's life. I don't think you could tease out of Mem Shin Hei the biography of Moses or of Dalit Vav Dalit, the biography of King David. I don't think that the name defines the person. That's much, much too strong. But there are qualities there, and they may be central to his, to his personality, but much more to a person than essential qualities. Defining a person is much, much too strong, uh, you know, much too uh, encompassing a, 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 an idea. Yeah. Um, um, my rabbi wanted to know, uh, what do you think is the relationship between God and the Torah, if any at all? Well, I guess, what was the relationship between God and the Torah? Um, I guess if you ask what the relationship is, there'll be many relationships, and they'll be all on, on, different, on different levels. If you're talking by the Torah, you're talking about the five, what we call the five books of Moses. 
the origin of the five books of Moses is that God dictated it to Moses letter by letter. Moses was like a stenographer taking down the dictation letter by letter. That's the origin of our text. Um, in that text, God packed, uh, according to some of our authorities, like the Maran, the Groh, and others, all of the information about the world and also information about where the world comes from and what purposes it's supposed to serve. Um, and it's packed in different ways. Um, the, some of you have probably heard of four different ways to approach the Torah, Pshat, Ramesh, Rush, and Sod. Roughly, very roughly, Pshat is the literal, logical meaning of the text. And Drush is ideas that can be extracted from the text using extended investigation. The drosh can mean to investigate. As one of my has put it to me, uh, the difference between them, this was very indicative. All this is very controversial. And to tell you what pshat is, we require 600 pages of text. Okay, I'm, so I'm, I'm answering the question in the Q&A. Um, pshat tells you what the words say. Drush tells you why these words were chosen to convey that message. Because once you figure out what the words tell you, you could ask, couldn't the same message have been communicated with other words? And often they, it could have. And often, for certain purposes, it could have been communicated more briefly or less ambiguously. And then you think to yourself, well, then if these words were chosen, there's, there's more to the message. Both Pshat and Drush deal with understanding what could roughly be called the meaning of the text. Remus and Sod treat the text as a conveyor of information not based on the literal meanings of the words. And the truth is that the text conveys information simultaneously in many different ways. And the truth is that they're all divine. A text has the meaning that the author put into it and that the society uses it for. And since there are many different ways in which the text carries information, and they are not exhausted by what we would call the meaning of the text, so it's a multidimensional conveyor of information. And having said that, there's no reason why Pshat is special. And here I'm fighting a terrific uphill battle, intuitive battle, and people have to struggle to get this straight. The literal meaning of the words isn't special. It's not better, it's not more true, it's not more valid, it's not more meaningful, it's not more applicable, it's not more divine than Kabbalistic hints in the text or the ideas conveyed by the crowns on the letters. We have a prejudice for the literal. It's, it's, the reason we have the prejudice is very simple, because we're lazy. And we, we can assess the literal on our own, and the others require specialized terminology, uh, methodologies. You have to go and study them and analyze how they, how they apply. So we take what's natural to us, we elevate it to a position of prominence. But it's simply not correct. Indeed, there's no reason for the text to have any pshat at all. It didn't have to have a pshat. It could be that you could ignore the, the, the pshat level altogether. Just, just ignore it and communicate on other levels. You have to be told that pshat is important. You have to be told that the others are important. So uh, the Torah communicates in many, many different ways, and all of them are, are genuine and are valid. And of course, Baruch Hu put in this text the information that he wants us to have so that we can live in a way that he wants us to live, relate to him in the way that we're capable of relating to him. That's the short answer. <laughs> Yeah, what else is on people's minds? Yeah. So one of the 13 principles of faith is the belief in God's non-corporeality, nor that he is affected by any physical occurrences such as human rest or dwelling. I was wondering, like, when we pray, prayer is sort of a physical act. I mean, we use our bodies and attempt to kind of affect Hashem, like, or affect our, our life. I was wondering, like, is, like, physical occurrences defined in a certain way that, like, omits, like, um, I'm just wondering how, like, how in the 13 principles of faith, the third one defines like physical occurrences. Well, how do we, if, if God isn't physical and is not affected by any physical occurrences, and we're physical, and we're physical, and we, I mean, of course, we're not only physical. 
the soul is not physical. And so soul is part of what you are. Physical parts, mechanical parts. You are using physical parts in addition to the non-physical parts. Okay. It's a compound performance. So already the question could be answered by saying that it's an interaction between the soul and God. Okay. Right. They could, you could say that, but it's not necessary. The, the way of putting the question has a false, a false premise also. And that is that God knows everything that happens in the physical world. Now, he doesn't know it by picking up light waves or absorbing energy or shining lights on it, right. but he knows it. So however he gets his knowledge, being non-physical and not being affected by the physical, however he gets his knowledge, my physical action is something that he takes note of, and that can be the basis for a decision that he makes. It doesn't require that he be a physical body to be cognizant of and to use as information physical events. All you have to understand is that he knows them. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, what's the difference between a love already and Rosh Hashua? <laughs> Um, one has one syllable, the other has two syllables. No, let's say speak to your Rebbe and then speak to her Rav. Like, what's the, These are terms in the colloquial language, Rav, Rebbe, and Rosh Hashiva, that, and they're probably used different ways in different communities, and uh, it's not official, it doesn't matter. You know, if you erased all three of them, nothing would happen. Jews would continue on without them. <coughs> Uh, usually, but uh, you'll find exceptions to this, but in my experience, the word Rav is used for someone who teaches Torah and more particularly gives halachic decisions. A Rebbe is someone who also teaches Torah, but also teaches by his personal example, and he may teach directly ways of serving God rather than more technical subjects like what does the Gemara Rishonim say and what does the Shulchan Aruch say, which means that many people are both Rav and Rebbe but they'll be Rav and Rebbe in different degrees, to different extents. Um, Rosh Hashiva is the person who runs a yeshiva, who is responsible for the general policy of the yeshiva. Yeshivas vary in policy. And he usually is the superior scholar, so he gives the top-level shir, top-level educational uh, effort. Um, that's roughly what a Rosh Hashiva does. But he also, hopefully, would be a Rav and a Rebbe. But again, it'll be in different degrees. You know, some people don't take it upon themselves to deal with personal, personal service of God in any direct way. Uh, I'll give you a bitter example. Um, there is a Mishnah Pirkei Avos which says, Halomi Torah dvar zokha bevarim harvei. Someone who learns Torah merits many things. A whole long list of Mishnah, the wonderful things that someone who devotes himself to Torah learning uh, merits. Okay? Okay, so I said the Mishnah wrong. What did I say wrong? Yeah, okay. Be embarrassed when I tell you. It says, Oh, Lishma. Oh, Lishma. Oh, what's that? You know, you're learning, right? You remember the Tysis? Okay, you're done. You're in. No, no, you have to learn it, Lishma. Now, what does the word Lishma mean? The Ramam defines Lishma in the 10th parak of Hilchah Shuva. Me'avas ha'adon asher tziva kein. Out of love, for the master who commanded it. That's the motivation that you're supposed to have. That's the highest motivation. The ideal motivation for doing a mitzvah is to do it out of love for the master who commanded it. So that mission of Pirkei Abbas promises a whole long list of tremendous benefits for someone who learns Torah lishma. Not like he learns chemistry or philosophy or accounting. But he learns it lishma out of love of the master who commanded him to learn it. So, now, who talks about Lishma? When's the last time you heard of Shmuz on how to do Lishma? Yeah. In some, case, some people, in some circumstances, in some communities, that's a topic of discussion. People talk about that. People think about that. And they want to know how to do it because it's an element in serving the Kosh Baruch In other communities, not. So there are various differences in subject. By the way, one of my, one of my sons told me a good example of how to learn Lishma. Uh, you and your chavus are working on a, a difficult passage, and you break off the session, and you don't get it. And you go home, and, and you think about it, and you get it. Got it! You come in tomorrow morning. What do you say? I got it! No, 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 no. What you say is, I, to I spoke it over with somebody, and this is what he told me. 
So you don't take credit for getting it. And you don't put your chavusa down. You didn't get it, but I got it, see? So, ah, you know, stand up when I walk into the room. Um, that's, that makes it a little bit more of the shema. For loving the Kodesh Baruch Hu and not doing it for the sake of my own, my own um, egotistical gain. Here's another example, which I thought of. You and your chavusa are talking about some very sophisticated subject in learning, and a beginner comes over and says, could you explain this Rashi to me? Now, of course you do it, that's what you do in a yeshiva. That's what, you, that's what the rule is. But how do you feel inside? Oi, am I missing out? 20 minutes is going to take me. I could have been learning Rabbi Kiva Eger, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm de- no. This is the mitzvah that the Creator put in my path at this moment. This is what He wants me to do. There's nothing more precious than doing what the Creator wants me to do. To do it with simcha, to do it with identification. Not a sense of irritation and loss. That would also make it more lishma. These are things which, in some quarters, are important things to think about, to talk about, and to, to analyze as part of Torah. In other places, it's, it's downgraded. So you have these, those variations. But what I'm talking about, that is more what you hear from a Rebbe than someone who's called a Rav. Yeah? So, learning from Shemona Ezra that Shuba um, is about son from Shem. Yeah. So why does it imply it? In, in, in the Ratzon. Why, why do we relate Shuvah with Ratzon Hashem? An interesting question. Not to say the others aren't, but it catches my interest. In the, in the Shemona Esrei, the, the middle blessings are blessings of petition. And you, you ask God's Baruch for things, and then the closing usually is, say Baruch to Hashem, and then describe Him as doing the thing that you're asking for. By the way, all in present tense. Doing, not has done. Um... In the case of tshuva, where we ask Hashem to bring us back to Him, we don't close it with, Baruch Hashem, the one who brings us back to Him. We close it with, Harot Tzeh He wants tshuva. But not do, does it. So I think the, the simple answer to that question is, He can't do it. Tshuva, by definition, is my turning myself around. If he turns me around, it's not my tshuva. Tshuva is return. That doesn't mean to be returned. It means to return. So when he picks you up and puts you down someplace else, you didn't return, you were returned by him. Now, it's very interesting that it says hashivenu, bring us back. So I think the answer to that, I think there's several answers, but the answer that, that, that appeals to me is, uh, bring us back in complete or perfect shuva before you. That leaves open the responsibility that we have to start it. We have to start it, and he'll finish it for us. Because if we have no hand in doing it, if he just does it, then it isn't shuva at all. That's why it says, I wrote shuva. He says he wants it. But you can't say he does it, because if he does it, then you're not doing it. Then if you're not doing it, then it's not yours. And all the other ones, it talks about, you ask him for forgiveness, he says he forgives. You ask him for, uh, for uh, uh, protection, and he protects. But he can't do that with you. Yeah, on the back. How would we know when, uh, when Messiah is the Messiah has come? And also, what would life be like in the Messianic times? Okay, I can't answer it in great detail because I haven't studied it in great detail, but the Rambam is very clear about this. In the last chapter of the Laws of Kings and Their Wars, he describes what could be called Cheskas Mashiach. It's a very important concept. That means a person does certain things and he has what you called, in, in halachic terms, a chazaka. What is a chazaka? As one of my friends put it, a chazaka is what you do until the doctor comes. <laughs> Okay, you know, he's bleeding. We've got to stop the bleeding, I suppose. On it, above it, like gangrene his, his arm, <laughs> who knows? Call the doctor. Right? In the meantime, chazoka means you presume certain facts because you don't know that they're true. But you act as if they were true until you get better information. There are certain conditions, like the person has to be a great tzaddik, a great Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar. He has to... Uh, gain the allegiance of a large part, part of the Jewish people, at least. And he has to propose to do the things that the Mashiach has to do, like bringing the Jews back from exile, like building a temple. Um, 
restoring the, the monarchy through opposed those things. If he has those qualifications, then it's Chesos Mashiach. Chesos Mashiach means you have to accept him and you have to pledge allegiance to him like Rabbi Kiva did to Bar Kokhba and you have to work to bring it about. Others disagree with Rabbi Kiva whether Bar Kokhba had those qualifications or not. But if, you, if you're, you're convinced that he has the qualifications, then you have to pledge allegiance to him and help him in the project. But that doesn't mean he is Mashiach. That means he has Chaz as Mashiach. That's what you're doing until the doctor comes. He's only Mashiach if he actually completes the things that are described in Novi that Mashiach has to do. Bring all the Jews back and, and re- rebuild the temple, reestablish their sacrifices. And the world should end up peaceful and recognize the fact that the Jewish people have the truth about the world. When all that takes place, then you know retroactively that he was the Mashiach. What will it be like? Okay, so that, that is a certain great different disagreement about that. Shmuel in the Gemara is famous for saying, The only difference in public life is going to be that we will not be under the control of other nations. We'll be able to live our own independent national life. The Rambam takes this literally, and he says the world will not fundamentally change during the times of Mashiach. Others have a different position. The, the answer to that is what the Roman writes in that same place. He says, what will happen in the time of Mashiach? We don't know. And the reason we don't know is because there are many verses in the prophets which describe it. The verses are vague and ambiguous and contradictory. And therefore, you don't get a clear picture from the, from the prophets. And there's no Torah Shavuot Peh. There's no oral tradition, he says. And therefore, there's no way for us to know what will happen in the time of the Mashiach. And he says, don't spend time on it. You know, you, that doesn't give, bring you to Av and Yerav Hashem. I bring you to doing mitzvahs better. So, uh, you know, you should, it's a, an article of our belief system that it will happen. And you know that, you recite that, and then you go about your business being the best, uh, best Jew that you can be. Yeah. So, <coughs> do we have a share somehow of uh, light? Is entirely um, the source of um, somehow the source of the system, or, or are we completely a, a, a reflection? I mean, because we've, we've seen a few ideas that these people reflect the moon, that reflect the light. And, uh, so, so, my question is do we really actually have uh, a source of light inside of us, or, 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 or we are completely a, a, a reflection of? of uh, are we, do we have our own source of light, or are we only a reflection of light? Well, let me ask you this. Suppose somebody gives me a flashlight, and I use it. So am I, do I have a source, or am I a reflection? He gives it to me. He's supplying with electricity. He's keeping the bulb burning, but I'm holding it. We have nothing of our own. To be, have something of your own, you have to be God. Nothing we have is our own. Everything we have is being created moment by moment. It has no existence other than through God's will. So I think that the lesson of reflection is the main lesson. It carries 99.9% of the reality. Now, it's true that he creates us in such a way that we have free will. And those free will decisions have some element of our own uh, origination in it. But he gives us the ability to originate. So it's, it's not as if we had our own independent source of light. It's certainly not like that. There's a nuanced gift where you give somebody a gift and you keep it operating and he, you know, uses it. Yeah? How do you know when you've done enough tshuva? Right, this is a very interesting question. How do you know if you've done, uh, done enough tshuva? Um, let me make the question vivid and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you my brutal reaction which is not an answer. Um, Rabbi Yonah says that complete tshuva is where you have strengthened yourself in such a way that you are immune to the temptation. This is different from the Rambam. The Rambam says that complete tshuva means you actually are tested and pass the test. The Rambam is difficult to understand because some of the transgressions that a person performs, it's forbidden to test yourself. It's forbidden to put yourself in danger. It's forbidden to look for the test. Of course, Kosh Baruch is not missing his, uh, 
uh, power and, and energy. If he wants to arrange it, test he'll arrange it. But you can't do it. So to tell me, well, you haven't done complete tshuva because Rosh Baruch Hu didn't decide to test you. Tshuva is a mitzvah. Doing complete tshuva sounds like it's my responsibility. According to the Rambam, strictly speaking, I can't do that. It's up to Rosh Baruch Hu wants to put me through the test. So Ben Yonah avoids that problem by saying that complete tshuva is where you strengthen yourself to the point where if you were tested, you would pass the test. But you don't have to actually pass the test. Now your question comes marching in on a white horse, right? How do you know that you've strengthened yourself enough to pass the test if you're not going to be tested? And I think the correct rea- response to the question is, you don't. So what? Why do you need to know? So you can stop working? Don't stop working. But just keep strengthening yourself. Make it a lifelong project to strengthen yourself as much as possible. You don't really know, need to know this. The things you need to know are the things which are necessary to be able to serve him appropriately. And if li- your lifetime, especially according to Rabbi Yonah, your lifetime is a lifetime process of tshuva, there's a threshold by which you can say, I've done enough so that I qualify for the benefits of tshuva. But that doesn't mean that you've exhausted the mitzvah of tshuva. And that it's a lifelong process, as he de- says explicitly about regret. Um, so then uh, it makes no difference. You just strengthen yourself. Uh, continue to strengthen yourself as much as you can. Yeah? So, uh, in the same way one may use like a scientific method, is there a method one should use when approaching halakhic questions? Yeah, Aristotle got this right 2,300 years ago. Different <coughs> subjects have different methods. There's no royal method for, um, for um, solving problems or conducting investigations. People are hypnotized by the scientific method they never know what it is, but they're hypnotized by it because of its social status, right? Don't stop to think that in mathematics you never use the scientific method. Nothing like it. Nothing even remotely resembling it. There are no observations. There are no hypotheses. There are no deductions of, of, of experiments. There are no, there are no uh, checks and balances. Mathematics, you prove things. When you prove it, it's proved. Period. We have proofs that are on, on record for thousands of years. No one's figured out a way to question them. I mean... So it's an entirely different method. And different subjects have different, different methods. For example, <coughs> experimental methods can check hypotheses by dedu- by, sometimes anyway, by deducing a consequence and, and, and running experiment. But suppose you have a historical science where it's trying to explain events that happened in the past and you're not going to be able to put, uh, do an experiment to test it. Is that just... Impossible? What about history? Is history just free play with no standards whatsoever? Well, what about, now we get to really controversial things, what about evolutionary biology? Evolution is supposed to be an event or a series of events or a process in history. And certainly the supposedly uh, 4.2 billion years of, of, um, of evolution can't be put to experimental test. That doesn't mean that it's empty or impossible to, to reason about, to have better or worse hypotheses, better or worse explanations. Different, different disciplines have different methods. Now, uh, in, in halakhic reasoning, of course, straightforward logic is used, but there are also principles of halakhic reasoning. And uh, you, you, have to, you have to learn them, and, and you learn them in context, like, uh, like you learn anything else. Um, for example, when someone, a person is presenting a proof, the proof, the standards of the Gemara are very high. It's not probabilistic. It's not, like I call my book, good reason. If there's any possible way in which it could be wrong, it's not a proof. So the, the standards are very high for proof. Not every issue uses that. In a criminal court in America, the proof has to be beyond the reasonable doubt. In the Gemara, it's more like beyond any, any doubt rather than any reasonable doubt. So different, different investigations have different standards. Them's the facts. Well, it's not. Yeah, okay. So what is the rationale for uh, the idea of emuna as rational trust? What's the rationale? F- f- I mean, wh- where did I come up with that way of defining it? Right. Okay, so I, I define emuna, which is usually translated in, in, in English, uh, even in our texts, as faith. I don't like the translation of faith because faith is a Christian word. 
Yeah. They have the right to their words. They have the right to their concepts. It's not just not a Jewish concept. Because the word faith typically means believing something that isn't logical. And then you have a split. Some believe it in spite of the fact that it's not logical. And some believe it because it's not logical. It's being not logical. It's its great praise. Look at the religious existentialists like Kierkegaard. If God is beyond man's understanding, then if you have a rule that you can understand, it can't be godly. Because he's beyond understanding. So it's got to be something that you can't understand. Okay, I think the, lo- the logic of that proposition is lousy. But, but there is such, a, such, a, such an attitude. That's what faith is attached to. I don't believe that we are ever asked to do or believe something irrationally. That's an adverb. I don't believe we're ever asked to believe or do something irrationally. That means there's always reason for what we do and believe. But of course, reason can be, comes in many different stripes and colors. When you take a pill because your doctor prescribed it for you, are you irrational? Probably not. Well, do you know what it's going to do? Do you know what its chemical constituents are? Do you know the physiology of your body and the chemistry that tells you what reactions are going to go on when you take it? So are you irrational when you take it? Not really, because you have good reason to trust the doctor to be doing something for your benefit. There are lots of ways in which what you do could be rational. Never are we asked to do something irrationally. So to have the 13 principles of faith, or to use faith as a Jewish word, is going to run up against that principle. So I don't, I, that's why I won't translate it as faith. But the word emuna in, in the Tanakh doesn't refer to belief at all. Nothing to do with belief. Joshua is fighting a battle in the desert before the, giving the Torah at Sinai. And Moses is on a mountain. And when his hands go up, the Jews win. When his hands go down, the Amalekites win. And then his brother and his brother-in-law are, are there, and they hold up his hands, and this is by Adav Emuna Ad Bo Hashemesh. His hands were Emuna until the sunset. His hands, fingers, elbows, his hands were Emuna until, until sunset. Did they believe something? Know something? Understand something? Assert something? Admit something? Not really. It's his hands. But they were faithful. They performed their, 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 their function uh, reliably. They lived up to expectations. That's what a moon is. A moon it means living up to expectations, doing what needs to be done, what, what, uh, what is appropriate to do. When Moses hits the rock and Aaron doesn't stop him, and they're both criticized and penalized for it. Uh, Baruch Hu describes their failure as Yan Lohe Mantembi. Because you didn't have a moon in me. They weren't flirting with atheism. Gee, did the world create itself or not? I wonder. You know, I think I'll hit the rock. No, that's not what was going on. <laughs> What's going on was you weren't faithful to me. You didn't trust me. I told you to do this. And you didn't trust me to trust me enough to do what I told you to do. So emuna means carrying out something in a reliable way that trust is, is, is justified. That's what it means in literal Hebrew. And I think that's the right way to translate it in, in you know. By the way, the phraseology that you have in the Siddur, ba'amin um, she, which we translate believe that, is not found anywhere in the Tanakh. In the Tanakh, it's ma'amin be. Ma'amin be means, I trust it. Ma'amin be means, I trust Hashem. When he tells me something's going to happen, it's going to happen. When he tells me something is, it is. I trust him and I accept what he has. Now, I'm not believing in his existence. That's not, it's not used that way. It's used in a sense of trust. So I think that's the classical Hebrew concept that's behind the word emuna. Is there a reason to philosophize about the nature of God? Well, one overwhelmingly right reason is that he taught us concepts about himself which need philosophical analysis to be understood. And in some cases, he even gave us some of the philosophical analysis. So he invited us into this kind of reflection. So I think that if you're asking about what 
rationale there is to do something, that's the only kind of rationale that's relevant. You know, there's not going to be an independent rationale without his having indicated to you that he wants you to do it. If not, it's just a waste of time, and we're not put here to waste time. Um, as I have explained to you, the idea that he's it's called Yochel, that he uh, has unlimited power, unlimited capability, um, it requires considerable philosophical thought to make sense out of that idea. I'll just give you a, 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 a lick of the, of the investigation. I'll, I'll, it's, it's recorded, and I think I did it fairly recently. But you certainly don't want to mean that he could do just anything. You don't want to mean he could do anything and everything. Because you don't want to say that God could learn something new. Do you? You still don't want to say that God could improve. Do you? To say that God could learn something new would mean he doesn't already know everything. To say he could improve would mean he isn't already perfect. You don't want to say those things. So a little reflection, and you think, hmm, so what do I mean? And the answer is, you don't mean anything, but the question is, what do the texts mean? What, what does God teach us about this? And you have to think about it. And there are more, more reflections of, along, that, along that line. So that the things that, that we're taught about God, uh, they require careful, careful uh, reflection. And by the way, the Kabbalah, so far from what in English is called mysticism, is a very elaborate, complex system with uh, definitions and deductions and uh, questions and answers and contradictions and resolutions. It's a very complex study. And if you've read something of the Jewish Kabbalistic tradition in English, trash it. It's full of things which, even if they are designed to be inaccurate, are going to lead you to utterly false places. If you have been told that the first thing that God did was to make an empty space so that things could exist there, because otherwise he fills all space and there's doesn't room for anything else, so he's an empty space, that's dead wrong. No spaces are ever empty. Never, ever. In the Kabbalistic thinking, there are no empty spaces, period. Furthermore, in the so-called space, the halal that the Arizal talks about, there are no tables, <laughs> no galaxies, uh-uh. It's not physical space, it's something else entirely. So uh, if, you, if you learn that, you, I'm telling you now, you're not getting what, what it's about. And uh, put it off to a later stage of your educational development, your Jewish educational development, because you're not equipped to really appreciate what it's about now. Yeah? At what point does Rav say religion becomes a cult? What point does religion become a cult? We worked on that. I'm here 41 years, maybe 35 years ago, the Israeli government wanted to pass a law against cults and wanted to make sure that it would not include the Balchuva movement because they didn't want to uh, push the Balchuva movement outside of the law. So they it came down to this yeshiva and other yeshivas and asked us for advice. How could we phrase the law that, uh, in such a way that it would uh, not imperil, imperil the Balchuva movement? So we discussed it. And what you want to do is find qualities that cults have which are objectionable. Not every cult that a cult has, that quality that a cult has is objectionable. You know, it's a fellowship of people engaged in a common activity. That's not objectionable. So that you know why you're outlawing it. Uh, the only thing that we could find is not turning children against parents because, now, this used to be a good argument. I was just going to work it anymore. But universities turn children against parents, and political parties demand allegiance, and, and people work themselves uh, uh, to the bone to, to, for elections, and uh, people become convinced that, that, that they're right, and they don't always treat other people with an appropriate amount of, of uh, respect, but that doesn't make it into a cult. I'm not talking about contemporary politics, but I'm talking about 40 years ago. So the two things that we found were misrepresentation and coercion. One of the guys, this is also back decades, came in to, one day and told me, I saw a poster on uh, King George Street which said in English, 
Uh, would you like to see Israeli society become more sensitive, more kind, more uh, 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 um, congenial? <coughs> would you like to do We have a group that's working to you know, soften, and things are pretty good today. <laughs> you know what they were like 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You know, so he goes to the meeting, and the speaker talks about you know, how to make people more polite and more considerate and so forth and so on. At the end of the meeting, it turns out that it's the Moonies, which is a real cult. But you don't know that till the end. Of the, till the end. Um, one of the techniques that the cults use is they advertise a weekend in the mountains at a hotel. What they don't tell you is they pick you up on a bus, they bring you to the hotel, there are no telephones and uh, no, show, no uh, um, bandwidth, nothing. You're totally out of, out of contact with the outside world. Only you are at the hotel, your, your group and your, the people who are in charge of you. There's no, it's, it's, it's dozens of miles in, you know, into, the, into the hills, and you're taken there at night, so you can't have any orientation as to where you are. You're trapped. You're absolutely trapped. And then they uh, sleep-deprive you, and they feed you high-carbohydrate, low-protein foods, so you lose your ability to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to pay attention and analyze. Um, so the two things that we found were misrepresentation and coercion. Uh, and then we said to the Israeli government, send your representatives down, attend our classes, observe our observances, and see, our, see the rules by which the yeshiva runs, and you decide for yourself whether we engage in, you know, we have a beginner section here. It runs on its own wavelength. But 30 feet from here are the trapped devotees, you know, who are our products. And they're sitting there learning for 12 hours a day. You want to know what we stand for? That's what we stand for. That's where we hope you'll go. We take you out to, to families, all of whom practice what we practice. You see how they live. Uh, our official standards, uh, I think we still have the same standards, for the weekdays, you need to be involved in some yeshiva activity seven hours a day. The rest of the day, you know, 17 hours worth is yours. Shabbos is off. You want to go to a kibbutz and eat pigs? Your job. You go scuba diving, no one's going to tell you what to do. That, you're getting free, free room and board here. For free room and board, you give us 35 hours a week. That's it. So uh, you have bandwidth here, and you, you, have your, you can have your computer here, and you have your cell phones here. You're certainly in touch with anybody you want to be in touch with. And we invite open questioning and controversy and discussion and debate. We are what the universities once were and we're supposed to be. Abandon that. Um, so uh, I think that that's what I would call a cult. Once in the practices, uh, those, two, uh, those two terrible practices. And I would challenge anybody to find uh, anything cult-like in what, in what we're doing. Yeah. Um, are philosophical concepts not related to or meaningless? Um, no. I mean, well, <laughs> now that's a trick question. Since the Torah is the roadmap of, rea of all of reality, then anything which has purchase on reality in an accurate way will be related to the Torah. There's nothing, it's something that the Gaon of Vilna said there are five sci uh, educational disciplines. And I know that math is one and music is one. And I forget the list. And he said, without knowing them to some extent, you won't be able to appreciate Torah. So they definitely are, are on the list. And then anything which is, which is genuine, uh, genuine knowledge will be related to Torah because at some point or other, it'll, it'll, it'll apply to either Torah's application to the world or understanding some concepts of Torah. But that last qualification is an important qualification. Um, I would offer the following Gedanken experiment for you. Uh, we are living now in 2022. Now, think back, well, to make it more vivid, think back 122 years, 1900. Think of what was taught in university in 1900. How much of what was taught in university in 1900 is taught in university today? Very little. All the physics was wrong. Well, the chemistry was, was unknown, just beginning as a science. Um, biology was, uh, had no foundations whatsoever. Um, uh, astronomy hadn't discovered galaxies yet. Um, you know, it's a gigantic amount. So now, 
Now ask yourself, 100 years from now, we're teaching in the universities today, how much is going to survive 100 years from now? Do you really think we've got the answers now? Now we know. Now it's all clear. And now it's going to stay the same? If you think so, you're very, very naive. You're very, particularly, you don't know that the two best theories in physics contradict one another, quantum mechanics and, and, and relativity contradict one another. Something's got to give, and they don't even agree on what's got to give. So, um, so then, you know, people go to, to university to get an education. I say you get an education in today's intellectual fashions. That's what you get education in. You get education in the world, in the truth. It's just simply not correct. Um, so, if it really applies to the world in an accurate way, in an objective way, then it will have relevance to Torah. But uh, a lot of the concepts that we have do not have that qualification. So you have to be very careful about how you apply, apply that idea. Thus is thus. Yeah, last question. Is it true you're not allowed to get in at night? So there are those, but it's only the first half of the night. I'm not allowed to say psalms at night. It's only the first half of the night. That's why people who say slichos do say from the middle of the night on. We all start, many, many start that way the first night. But the, the first half of the night is hard, strict judgment. It's a time when plea for mercy, plea for special consideration is hard to be heard. From the middle of the night on, that's already where you're preparing for sunrise, you're approaching sunrise, and uh, there, the situation becomes more relaxed. That's why the Gemara tells us that King David had his kinor, where the wind could blow through the strings, and at midnight, it played music to wake him up because he used the second half of the night to do whatever he did at that time, you know, kind of communing with God, learning, creating tillum, whatever he was doing, he did it in the second half of the night. So I wouldn't say that everybody agrees to this, but, but I think it's a, it's a common idea. And the exception would be if there's danger. If there's danger, then uh, you would say Psalms in, uh, at night also. But uh, other than that, and, and this isn't the complete picture. It's not a subject that I've, I've, I've investigated carefully, but th this is as much as I know about it. Okay.